Yes. Gold's going to do incredibly well. Probably Bitcoin's going to do much better. We saw gold go up 10x in, in the 70s. I wouldn't be surprised if I see Bitcoin do much better than that in the next day. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined by repeat guest Charles Edwards, uh, who is the founder at Capriol Investments. Charles, welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are joining us via video, uh, Charles has some artwork in the background that I guessed was <laughs> Star Wars based artwork. Charles told me it's abstract. And I think I just <laughs> out of myself as a massive nerd who sees uh, Star Wars in just abstract black and white paintings. But um, it's a it's a nice spot that you've got there, Charles. I like that, like the artwork in your background. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Just just setting up, but uh, it could be inspired by Star Wars. You never know. <laughs> but yeah, you open to know. interpretation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Charles, uh, I, I'd like to start maybe kind of at a high level here. I think we're going to get into sort of the weeds on both, like kind of the the high level macro, but then you know translate how that uh, you know how that flows into rates um, and expectations around rates and where that intersects with with Bitcoin. But I'd like to start with kind of the ten thousand foot view of of macro. So, you know, if you had to kind of talk, you know, we're recording this on January 23rd, like where do you see sort of the macro environment uh, from, from your perspective today? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, obviously coming off the back of 2022, which was uh, a, a tough year to say the least for crypto. Um, it, you know, it, it, it exposed a lot of, you know, sad developments with uh, FTX and fraud and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, that opened up a lot of value, I would say, especially when you think about Bitcoin leading the market. Uh, it, it put us in a spot where cyclically there's a deep value opportunity. Uh, we had the 80% st type drawdown, which also aligns with a lot of on-chain signals, which is suggesting deep value. So on the, the Bitcoin crypto side, I think it's put us in a great place for long-term investors that are, are, are willing to see that potential long-term upside. And then when, it, when you consider the broader macro or, or economic cycles, uh, there's obviously, again, been a lot of uncertainty last year. Um, we, we, you know, we've come into one of the, the toughest or, or the hardest um, uh, monetary policy regime changes ever uh, in terms of the speed of, of rate rises. That's pretty much the highest on record in the last century or so. So it's, that's created a lot of shock for markets. And at the same time, a lot of bad sentiment. Um, we saw pretty much every sentiment metric you could think of across macro equities, uh, uh, crypto, et cetera, at either the greatest or the second greatest, most bearish readings. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's pre pretty much anyone you asked on Twitter at the end of last year would have said, yeah, we're either we're in a recession or it's coming to a recession or what have you. And those odds are quite high, so just by a number of different metrics, but uh, they've also come back a bit as well. Um, and then on top of that, you have different readings suggesting, you know, housing market is slowing and housing market, for example, often leads uh, the greater economy. Um, so there's a number of metrics which suggest things are slowing down a bit. you got, you know, all the big tech names are, are laying off employees. And you see that as well in crypto as well as, you know, 10, 20% employee uh, base cuts and not that unusual in the last few months. So a few things in, in the mix, um, but things are not as bad as they seem in terms of value broadly, in terms of unemployment rates are still, you know, employment is still very strong. It's at a place we'd expect it to bottom, but it hasn't really started to show that trend change of, of, of increasing unemployment. So there's those factors. And then you have um, another uh, chart I'm just looking at on my screen, which I tweeted a, about a month ago. But every time inflation's peaked above five percent and then dropped twenty percent, the Fed's pivoted, and that's um, over the you know looking at the last fifty years or six, 50, 60 years of data. So there's a higher probability, I would suggest, that the Fed either stops raising rates this year um, or reduces rates. Um, and that, you know, feeds into things like housing prices and potentially if the unemployment rate does start to tick up and potentially, um, you know, with the manufacturing index, indexes, which have come right down as well. So I, I think that all of that means, okay, we've probably got, uh, we've got terrible sentiment, which is usually quite good for <laughs> investment opportunities, mm. um, or we did in the last couple of months. And then we have 
likelihood, I would say, of a, of a regime change from the, uh, the Fed or the monetary policy stance, or at least a pause. Um, and then we've got this deep value situation in crypto, which has been playing out the last sort of three or four months. So that's where it really kind of led, it, led us into the beginning of this year. And, and all of that for me sets up a, a great opportunity for, for long-term investors in crypto and, and probably uh, equities as well, or risk assets in general. So it's hard to know when each of those elements play out, you know, a rate change regime, et cetera, but I think that's the next three to six months. Um, so, you know, we, all that fed into great opportunity at the start of the year. We've, we've seen markets com- continue to rally, especially Bitcoin is up 50%. Uh, from the 16k low over the last two months, so that you know the FTX fraud, probably the third biggest fraud of all time, has already been fully retraced, and mm. that just shows you that alone, like that was a devastating impact for the industry, and that alone being completely recovered in two months tells you that there's so much long-term value over that period that it, you know it's hard to be too bearish, if you know what I mean. I, I, it, mm. Yeah, I, I think. Anyone who's got a, a long year investment horizon, you know, one, two year horizon here, you're not going to get much better opportunities than we saw in sort of December, early Jan. Um, we may be due in the short term for a bit of a correction if we're looking just at Bitcoin because we've had that 50% almost straight line up. Um, but it, it's indicative for me of a regime change. So a new kind of momentum shift happening. Uh, Charles, what do you attribute that? So we're recording this again on the 23rd, and I think Bitcoin is about, at about 23,000 right now. And, you know, it, similar runs in all the majors. Basically, crypto's recovered uh, somewhat off the lows. What do you attribute that that run to? Yeah, so for me, it's the, 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 the accumulation of, of all those elements I talked about. So, yeah, if, if you break each one down, the sentiment, disastrous, which is always good for a squeeze. Um, the, 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 the markets broadly are becoming aware that the Fed is going to have to slow or, or, or you know, revert. The equities have, have been rallying as well for the last month or so. And anyone who wanted to sell in 2022 has sold or been forced to sell. So we had a whole year of, you know, from November 21, straight down, pretty much down 80%. And along the way, multiple liquidations of funds and different entities which forced people who didn't actually want to sell to sell. So you, you've had that 12-month period of pretty much devastation in the markets where if you wanted to get out, you have. Mm-hmm. And those that are left are probably not going to sell at this point, um, even if we do you know, go a bit lower. I don't see a, a significant amount of selling capacity left in the market. So as soon as you have those buyers entering, you create a sell-side um, liquidity crisis where you get a squeeze up. And we saw that kind of short squeeze play out in the first two, two and a half weeks of Jan um, into an illiquid market with really bad sentiment and great value. Um, and, you know, there's a few, there's always some kind of trigger which starts the initial movement. You could argue that some of that was linked to funds being recovered for FTX or, that, you know, they found, you know, three to five billion, certain things like that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's as soon as you get any kind of event, any kind of, positive shift which then triggers the the short squeeze you you have this you know great price uh, movement play out and then and then all that has created also really you know from just a pure technical price action point of view a really great structure um, where we had this big deviation from the 20k level which was the prior you know 2017 cycle all time time high we kind of were basing there for a while we had the fraud we collapsed through it created extraordinary value we hit Bitcoin electrical costs, which has only happened you know, four times, usually for a couple of days at all in history. So ultimate really long-term value for Bitcoin as far as concerned. We, we spent about a month below that and then broke back above. And so on a technical basis, we've just we've had that deviation below, you know, pretty much the biggest support level on the chart, broken back above it. And that usually those kind of deviations where the, the first move is kind of a fake out creates a really strong um, technical signal. So lo- pretty much every data point um, I look at has a kind of a line to say, yeah, as long as we're staying above uh, 19, 20K, then things look like either the bottom is in or you know, the, the regime is completely changed. So 
that's that's great. I think we've had about a quarter, you know, four or five months of what I would call deep value in crypto, which I've been writing about in the Capriola newsletter each month, and it's kind of it obviously got better with the November December period. But deep, you know, value and and when on chain readings are, look great, it's hard to know how long that will last. Uh, it it can be anywhere from a week to six or seven or eight months or more potentially and probably longer as as this industry develops. But what's great is when you kind of start to leave that value space or the deep value space. And I think we've started, you know, anywhere above 20, 22K, we've, we've left the deep value opportunity, I would say, and we've kind of added in the new kind of momentum regime change shift, um, which is actually the better signal. Like, for example, if you look at hash ribbons, uh, metric I have it's a combination of, of of value from hash rate and then momentum and when you kind of get that symphony of momentum and and uh, or, or price action and and value kind of converge it's really the the strongest signals from a trading perspective or from an investment perspective and gives higher odds I would say of, of continuation or, or or at least that the regime has shifted. So, so Charles, for some listeners who might not be familiar with different like valuation metrics, you know, you, you're using this phrase sort of deep value. Can you, can you kind of walk through like how you do, like, what are, what are the sort of metrics that you use? You start to get into one, which is hash ribbons there. Maybe you could use that as a jumping off point, but any, uh, anything else that you use like frameworks for valuing, let's say Bitcoin specifically, like how does this, like, how do you tell that this falls into the, the deep value zone? Yeah. So, so when I talk about value, it's, it's kind of taken from. Uh, I guess equities, uh, where you might value a company from, you know, its earnings or its revenue or different multiples, P multiples, etc. And you're essentially looking at based on on history. So usually you'd, you'd have a, you know, a window where you're assessing relative value over, say, could be a year, five, 10 years or more. Um, and is something trading at a relatively cheaper value for its fundamentals of of that business? In time, obviously, crypto is is much is very different to that. We have um, different data points. It's a bit trickier to you know. It's it's quite unique, but there are ways of doing it. And you know, there's an array of metrics I, I like to look at. Hash ribbons is one which identifies capitulation in the mining industry. My favorite long term signal would be the electrical cost or production cost, which is effectively the cost it is to create a Bitcoin from for miners globally on average based on their electrical mm. price data. And cost of production has essentially been a flaw for many assets in, in history. And it turns out that for Bitcoin, the electrical cost, as I mentioned just earlier, it, it price has only touched it very few times in the past, three or four times. And it's usually for a day or less, occasionally for a week or two. The one we had in November was one of the longest and it turned out to be pretty much the exact bottom again. Um, so there's a couple there. Other, other metrics are based on sort of Metcalfe's law, so adoption of networks and growth. Um, you have um, DNVT, which is the network value, so market cap um, over the transactions that, have, that go through the Bitcoin. So you could argue that you know, Bitcoin is a, a payment layer or a store of value. So the summation of all value that's transmitted from party one party to another kind of creates value in that network. So if it was just you and me transacting on Bitcoin, probably wouldn't be very valuable. But if you've got, you know, 100 million, a billion people using the network, it's more valuable as a, as a, a payment layer or a store of value. So when you divide the market cap by the value going through the network, that's another metric to, to get a kind of an oscillator of, of value. And that mm. metric, for example, was in deep value in sort of November, December. It's now kind of broken out of that and into sort of a more normalized level. That's not to say that um, the current rally is completely over. It's just, uh, it, it, it suggests that we have that kind of regime change and, and shift, um, which could mean that in the near term there's some correction due, but, uh, you know, over, a, when I say near term, I'm thinking days and weeks versus long term being months six months to a year plus um so near term could be some correction long term i think it still suggests we're in a, a good place you you mentioned one other uh sort of classical bottoming sign which was minor capitulation he used to just describe that dynamic uh for those who might not be familiar like what do we mean when we say minor capitulation why does it tend to mark the bottoms yeah so 
as with everything in crypto or Bitcoin, everyone kind of interprets or defines things slightly differently. But for me, <laughs> yeah, which can make things confusing. Um, but for me, minor capitulation is any is is a reduction, a measurable reduction in hash rate of the network. So hash rate is effectively, you know, a measure of the energy committed to mining Bitcoin. Um, in and and that at the end of the day is it, it shows you at a raw level, you know, you know, pure data really what what level of commitment there is from miners to the network. And if that goes down by 10, 20 percent. Really, the 10 to 15% plus mark is where I'd consider a capitulation. We have a significant drop in hash rate. And that's because through history, hash rate is broadly just trended straight up. And you have these brief periods where it drops significantly, sometimes as much as 40 or 50%, such as when um, you know China banned mining and also when we had mm. a really big collapse from 6K to 3K in Bitcoin price in 2018-19. So... It's a drop in, in hash rate, so uh, you know a, a weakening of the network security potentially. But why why would miners why would the hash rate go down? So it means they're turning off rigs. It means different entities may be uh, losing money or have you know decided not to stick with Bitcoin um, or they need to cut costs, etc. So hash rate drops, and that is a great signal of of potential bottom formations because. You, in general, any kind of capitulation, any industry would, you know, usually occurs in the worst times. Um, so it, it tends to be after you've had some kind of price pullback or, or other events happen and then you get, okay, we're at this point where it's really hard to operate it, and kind of like letting go of employees as well that we've seen in tech, big tech and crypto redundancies, et cetera, happen. Rigs get turned off to, to save and costs. Um, and then the question is, when do you allocate or how long does that last? So uh, I obviously created the hash ribbon metric a few years back, and that's pretty much just a simple moving average, two simple moving averages applied to hash rate. Um, and when they kind of cross down, you enter this capitulation zone. Usually it's between that 10 to 40% reduction in hash rate. And then when they cross back up and you have price momentum as well, it's been historically a great buy signal. So the next question is how relevant are miners in Bitcoin today? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, the last cycle, so three, four plus years ago, they were the dominant party, the, the largest institutions, largest entities and holders of, of Bitcoin in the space. They're still very significant today, but their relative impact network is reducing with the halving cycle. So I think this metric is still useful but it's not as useful as it was four years ago, but it is more useful than today than it will be in four years' time. So I, I still use that metric a lot. I still value it highly. Um, it tends to also align with other events. So we had the 3AC collapse. We had the FTX um, fraud, et cetera. Great amount of stress in the network. And then we saw minor selling go through the roof. They were selling more than they have in four or five years. And then we had a, a hash rate capitulation, which mm. confirmed that a lot of signals were aligning at the same time. And then now we've just recently had the, the hash ribbon buy or the, the positive momentum shift in hash rate and price, um, which occurred about a week, week and a half ago. And um, at the 20.8K uh, mark, pretty much the same price we saw the last signal you know, about a month ago. So yeah, all of these for me are suggestions of great stress in the industry uh, coming out of capitulation and re entering recovery, which historically is all, have all been you know, great buy signals. And, you know, this was to, at the risk of editorializing a little bit, this was got to be one of the most challenging environments that miners have been in in the history of Bitcoin because miners are kind of, you know, they're levered to energy prices, right? And they're levered mm. to in, in a way, interest rates, right? So you, they, yeah. they got kind of crushed on both sides when rising rising rates sent the price of Bitcoin down and skyrocketing energy sent the price of energy up. Those are the two metrics that they're levered to as a business. And it's it's pretty typical, right? Like that there are sort of, um, you know, it's almost you can imagine like sort of the forest fire analogy where, you know, the mining rigs like, you know, during bull runs, like people lock themselves into 
uh, you know, buying, you know, having a rig set up with an energy cost that just doesn't make any sense. As soon as Bitcoin, the price goes down, those rigs, people want to turn those off and it's not profitable. And those rigs pass from weaker to stronger hands. And there's a little bit of consolidation in the mining space, but then ultimately you wind up with like a more solid base of miners, right? That like know what they're doing and are controlling their cost of energy. The, the other thing that happened during this particular cycle was there, there was the introduction of debt, right? Which uh, mm. there was like a bunch of miners uh, were financed via, via debt, which is, which is good if you were managing that properly, but it definitely kept the hash rate up higher than it should have been, right? For a long period of time, because miners were able to go on for longer than they historically have been able to in the past. So it just made for a cocktail of enormous stress uh, in the mind. And it seems like that's been largely worked out now. Or am I wrong? Yeah, that, that? that's well said. Well said. I think, uh, yeah, cocktail of uh, several items which created um, more stress. So, yeah, like I said, the um, energy prices, uh, the debt, interest rates all kind of added up. I think there was some poor risk management in there as well, which you kind of touched on with the use of leverage. And, and also, just generally speaking, a lot of miners were having the attitude of, we never sell, we just buy because Bitcoin price goes up. And obviously, long term, that's a, a great strategy if you're not leveraged at all. But you have to be ready for these 80% pullbacks, which we've just had, and um, which usually happen every three or four years in Bitcoin history. You know, a lot of people thought 2021 that the you know the halving cycle was over, or the impact of Bitcoin cycle mm. was over because it was so much bigger. Um, I thought that they were still there, but that there would be somewhat diminished but we've seen right now that they're still very much in play and there's a good argument there that, that a lot of that was you know maybe a lot of that downside was driven by the ftx 3ac type um issues we had in the industry but nonetheless they played out pretty much the textbook so yeah it it and it and it does leave the mining industry in a better place with those that are left so it's also worth noting that when i when we talk about capitulation hash rate everything that represents the global average of the of the industry and people get very different prices you know from texas for you know one or two cents to you know more um you know other other countries where the rates are seven eight nine cents per kilowatt and then you add on per top kilowatt. of that the inflation in in in, in commodities etc so it varies a lot and usually the ones that sell and capitulate are the the less efficient operators and the the highly efficient you know conservative risk managed operators they continue um, business as usual so it does leave the industry in kind of a, a cleaner slate so to speak um and kind of ready for for future growth and we've already seen the hash rate pretty much fully recover from here Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, it is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year, we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas? Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> uh, so last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had the two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bot. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times. Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero. Just a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you'll get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10, because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. You know, there was, uh, you know, you, you were sort of alluding to, and you said, there was a theory back in 2021 that the that the effect of the halvening would be diminished, you know, moving forward. I think what you were referring to there was the super cycle thesis, yeah. which, man, <laughs> it, that lost a lot of people, a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, even my even if you didn't fully believe in the super cycle, there was a there was sort of a, a more moderate version of that same idea, which was, look, this industry isn't going to progress in predictable four year, you know, four year cycles. Mm forever, right? Eventually mm. that's going to change. So far, it's looking like we, for the time being, are still going to repeat these, yeah. you know, sort of four-year cycles. I mean, do, do you have like a view on that? Like, do we ever get out of our cyclicality as an industry? Is the having going to continue to be, you know, sort of this catalyst event um, that it's been in the past? Like, what what's your sort of, because what's your, what's your sort of take there going yeah, forward? Yeah, my, my view is pretty much the same. I think that you could argue, it's kind of like a, a asymptotic progression to a you know a single valley, so to speak, <clears throat> where you have this oscillation of the halving cycles on the way. 
So I think that the impact of the cycles diminishes with time. We've seen that already with the upside, where every cycle, the upside return on Bitcoin has reduced a bit. Um, so far, the downside is relatively consistent, but it's still nowhere near as bad as it was in the last cycle. So I think, uh, don't quote me, the number was 78, 79% down from this cycle so far, assuming the bottom is in, then you know we've had prior cycles where it's been into the mid 80s. So we're we're doing better than that. And so it, it kind of is getting just less volatile with time. So we're seeing that in volatility as well. In general, the volatility over the last years in Bitcoin has reduced a bit. So it's it's kind of a smoothing out of the cycle, but it still has an impact. And I think this next one um, will definitely still have an impact as well because the the um, in effective inflation rate of Bitcoin, so the Bitcoin produced per year, will be dropping below that of gold. And that will make it, you know, programmatically with certainty, the hardest asset in the world. Obviously, we have other things like Ethereum, which um, are somewhat deflationary, but this, there's no level of long-term certainty there at the moment. Whereas with Bitcoin, we know the next 100 years we're locked in and the inflation rate will drop below gold. So that will really kickstart, I think, a... Um, a bit of a, a narrative there against gold as well. I have a question on both of those, both these counts. Um, so, you know, the the ultrasound money you know, Ethereum meme is kind of an interesting one. I I almost wish that I, I'm not a huge proponent of the ultrasound money meme. I, I wish that I, I'm a fan of both Ethereum and Bitcoin mm -hmm. as assets. I kind of wish Ethereum would just be this sort of smart contract platform and there's you know value in the utility and i think bitcoin has kind of won in my at least in my view the the hard money sort of battle but i think there are challenges to both models that i don't often hear questioned uh so i'll ask you i'll tell you what they are and then maybe you could respond to like each, each one of them but you know having it we've never there are very few assets that i can think of at the size that ethereum is that operates in a deflationary way even mm. if you think about gold, it, there still is a slight inflationary rate, right? I don't know what it is, but it's around like 1% or something like that from new gold being discovered and produced from mining companies. Even the huge companies like Apple, right? There's still some slight rate of inflation that happens. And, you know, people tend to view inflation in like binary terms, like inflation is bad. And I've always kind of been in the camp of like, well, what are you getting for that inflation, right? Because if you inflate yeah. the value of your equity, but you purchase labor and then the labor that you get for that, you know, makes the value of the company go up 5%, then you're up. Then that was a good thing. So I actually do wonder if the deflationary aspect is, is good. Actually, we've just never really seen an asset like that. On the Bitcoin side of things, you mentioned the 100 year time frame. There is, it's starting, this was an old debate that's like starting to move back into the fore about like our transaction costs going to be enough to cover the security of Bitcoin when the block rewards uh, block subsidies kind of go away. So I'd be, I'd be curious like to get your perspective maybe on the, the security model of Bitcoin and whether or not you think we're going to have to change the, the 21 million hard cap if you're in that camp or not. And then maybe if you could respond to the, the ETH uh, ultrasound money idea. Yeah, they're both very tough questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, we've never seen a deflationary asset before. Um, in theory, you know, it's like, if you keep halving something forever, it never goes to zero. So you could argue that maybe that works, but I don't know. The old Zeno's yeah. paradox. Right? It's, it, yeah, it's actually, it's, yeah, we also the rate of deflation, deflation is, un, it, you know, it's based on transaction volume, that sort of thing. So you, yeah, I, I don't have a strong view on it, to be honest. I think that if it's mm. maintained for, a long period of time because that's the thing with ethereum we've seen the the supply model change a lot in time it's kind of gone up in different levels and down and up and now it's deflationary so we need more time i think i think if if it was in this level of a relatively consistent rate of deflation in say five years time i think that would be a very interesting discussion about okay it's established a track record of consistency of somewhat deflation assuming the network is still working as expected and growing, then that would be potentially a contender to Bitcoin. People will <laughs> be upset by that. But it, to me, it's about the trust and track record of something which builds confidence. So, you know, when Bitcoin was three or four years old, no one trusted it. They thought it was magic internet money and a scam. But after five, 10 years, you build, oh yeah, it's, it's trustworthy, consistent, same model, et cetera. So arguably that's possible. Will it happen? 
maybe less than 50% chance it would be my guess. I think that at the moment, Bitcoin is probably, like you said, the the real contender for hard money. It's, it, it, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that can change and go wrong, arguably with, with Ethereum in that period of time, but we'll see. So I'm, I'm open-minded to it, but I don't have a strong view at the moment. Like I said, I just think it depends how much of a track record and trust it can build in that kind of model over time. Mm. And it's way too early to say at the moment. Um, for Bitcoin, I, I don't see the, the structure changing anytime soon in terms of the 21 million cap. Um, at the moment, it's a great point. The fees are very low and how would that work long term? Um, you know, it, again, it, it will only work if we have adoption way higher than it is today. And at the moment, things are trending that direction in terms of the growth rate of Bitcoin uh, is faster than the internet was. Uh, at a similar period in the late 90s. So it's growing exceptionally fast. Uh, it looks like it could well be a contender for the you know, future global money and, and store of value. And if that scales to billions, which uh, it looks like it's on track to do, then probably I think the fees will kind of come up and over 10, 20 years that will kind of start to balance out. But again, you know, we'll probably, these kind of discussions will probably become relevant in sort of 20, 30, 40 years time, um, where it will really depend. Okay, have, have things adopted as expected in terms of users and and what do the fees look like at that point in time? So if there was a change, I think it's a long way out, um, such that it's not even, you know, it wouldn't even register in terms of valuation at this point. But um, yeah, we, we kind of, it has to, obviously Bitcoin has to scale and has to have adoption um, to see this, you know, work out in the long run but all signs at the moment suggest that is happening yeah um it's a uh, it's it's a good point i I, i'll be because you you could you could see a world where you know it's almost seeming like but this happens this is going to be the case for ethereum as well where ethereum becomes less of a chain where people you know retail users transact on it right and they move one layer up and then ethereum is served for larger transactions that you know you could have a, a higher cost per transaction, and you could see a similar model like that maybe happening with with Bitcoin, where you know maybe it is a hundred dollars to secure a transaction, but if you're securing ten million dollars worth of value, then you don't really care about that, right? And the security assurances of Bitcoin is ultimately what ends up being the most important thing. Exactly, and also the long term cost for at least like electricity and production of Bitcoin, it's becoming more and more efficient with time. So it's really hard to predict mm -hmm. where that will be. In 10, 20 years. So just the cost of production alone has dropped quite significantly, you know, from the high single figures to the low single figures today. You hear lots of announcements of one or two cent production facilities set up. You hear stories of, you know, potentially zero electrical cost setups um, by using excess power. Uh, it could be flaring, could be um, hydro, etc. So I think things become more and more efficient for operators in general over time. Uh, and in the hardware in general, it's about, you know, five, 10,000 you know, times more efficient than it was before ASICs were introduced. So assuming things keep trending in that direction, obviously the fees don't have to be on a relative portion um, as high as we may expect, assuming power and hardware efficiency, et cetera, gets better and better with time. But yeah, it, it all, it's all one of those things that we, you need to see the adoption, the user growth, et cetera, all play out over the next, say, decade before we can kind of really assess mm. how it will be in sort of 80, 100 years. Yeah. Mm. So zooming out for a second back to where we were sort of talking in the beginning, a higher level sort of macro view, you know, the, the, the you know, the point that you made um, kind of early on the indicator about, uh, you know, bouncing back, you know, at this level of uh, um, inflation was a very good one. There was another, there's a quote that Stan Druckenmiller said, uh, you know, we've never stopped inflation until we bring federal funds rate above headline CPI. And, you know, at the time that he said that quote, that was pretty mind blowing, right? Because that looked like mm. an impossible statistic. Now it's kind of like, well, you know, headline, I think last month, uh, you know, December came in at 6.5, was it? Or something? Yeah, 6.5, I believe. Around and, that, you around know, that, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the terminal rate is, you know, hovering around 5%. So we're not wildly far off, right? So if things keep trending in the way that they're trending, maybe, you know, around like anywhere from like March to, to June or something like that is when that, that, that line flips. I'd be curious, though, 
just because it's become very consensus for people to say the Fed is going to pivot, they're going to have to pivot. And whenever that something a view yeah. is that consensus, it makes me a little nervous. So what's yeah. the what's the like the steel man for why the, the Fed might not pivot, right? Why may they might decide to keep rates to keep rates elevated? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll come to that. So that, your first point is really interesting. That what that's what drove me the Drucker Miller quote to look at that in quite a bit of detail. Mm. I just got a, a chart on my screen. I could um yeah so this is um I also tweeted it in our newsletter. So yeah as I said earlier on today every time it's peaked above five percent but then dropped so once the inflation rates dropped um by more than um twenty percent so where these red lines are the Fed has pivoted or, or you see here the Fed fund rates at the bottom. So every time inflation's mm. come down from this peak, the Fed fund rates either gone sideways or down um, mm. and usually down quite a lot. So, yeah, so I found that interesting with um, Drucker Miller's quote because the data suggests the last 60 years, it's, it depends, right? But it's not right based on the current conditions of how inflation's trending. Um, so that that's, that's an interesting one. Um, so... What, yeah, what does that, and that's obviously no guarantee um, for where things go. And as we see in the 1970s, uh, inflation, you know, went through a roller coaster ride of up and down. And that could be the case for the next five, 10 years as well. It just depends how it's all handled through that period. But I do think that the base case for me is at least um, a pause. So no further rate rises this year um, at, uh, at some point in the coming months. Um, what could change that? I think, yeah, it's, you know, just continued strong economic readings, really. If, if the Fed's got no reason to slow down or if inflation ticks back up, um, yep. then they would definitely have a strong argument not to uh, change course. So inflation, uh, sorry, uh, as I said, employment's very strong and that's probably the number one reading, I think, which feeds into um, recessions and, and definitions of that. There's a few metrics, but that's really... When the people are in a bad place, that's usually the the item which triggers a recession and reversion in in policy. Uh, and employment rates are still incredibly strong. You know, as I said earlier, they're showing signs of where they would normally bottom and pick up, but it hasn't yet happened. It could happen any months now, um, especially given the the you know the unemployment uh, sorry the uh, the layoffs we're seeing in big tech. But if that stays strong and if inflation doesn't go down or, or it even ticks back up, then, of course, I think the Fed will change. So just looking at the data we have right now, for me, it suggests that the pause or change is coming, but that could very quickly change in three, six months if the data changes course or, or you know, it, also equities as, is a consideration. If they're breaking out new all-time highs or if earnings are, you know, very strong still, manufacturing kicks back up, and inflation's still at five and a half, six percent, then the Fed might be like, well, we can keep going because everything still looks okay. But as I said, I think at the moment that's less likely to happen yeah. based on the data we're seeing. I think, you know, when it comes so Fed has singled out the labor market as something they're paying a lot of attention to, right? Unemployment, which is still at historic lows. I think all these headlines that are coming about big tech layoffs are a bit of a red herring because, you know. First of all, big tech, there was some, there's some statistic out there where it's like, if you laid off the entire technology industry, yeah. right? As like SaaS, internet, all these like, you know, Uber sort of sexy companies, it would impact the whole unemployment rate by like 0.2% or something like that, yeah. right? So all of these are relatively inconsequential. Then if you even zoom in on like the Microsoft uh, or like the Google, you know, they laid off, I don't know, around 12,000 people or something like that. That sounds high until you look at the total amount of employees that they have at Google and the amount that they've hired in the last year, which is like 30,000. So they're still, yeah. you know, to get back to where they were at 2021, they would need to cut their headcount by like 20%. So, yeah. you know, all of these headlines are a little bit misleading to me, right? And frankly, they're right in the, the frothiest sector, which is getting getting smacked. You know, they're, they're, they're you know, a risk asset and their stock prices are down a lot. So... Yeah, I don't know. No, exactly. Um, I, I, I agree with that. Exactly right. Like, at the end of the day, and, and that's why I like, for example, with Bitcoin hash rate as an aggregate metric, because it's the aggregates or the that matter the most for these kind of things. Yeah. So as you say, we've got a number of headlines of, of large number layoffs, but it's somewhat anecdotal in the bigger picture of unemployment, which is still, sorry, employment, which is still, uh, sorry, unemployment, which is still near all-time lows. So 
it suggests that the the the, the global or the, the the larger impact is still quite negligible today. But um, obviously, it all starts this way as well. So we, it, it it could be a starting signal of a broader shift. And usually, the also when the unemployment is at lows like this state, usually doesn't last that long. So it's it's usually synonymous with the end of a sort of business cycle. So we'll we'll see. It doesn't have to be, but. Yeah, it's it's worth monitoring, but until those those more aggregate numbers pick up, I, I agree with you that you're better off, you know, listening to the bigger picture. Agreed. I d- I just want to just make sure that I got it was it was twelve thousand employees. That's about six percent mm. of Google or Al- Alphabet's full time workforce, which is uh, around one hundred and sixty thousand full time employees. So I saw there was a letter floating around on Twitter that some. You know, the activist investors are out, right? And some activist investor wrote, I saw it to, you know, Dear Sundar, which I thought was a funny way to, reject. but, you know, we want you to basically continue on the good work of, you know, reducing, reducing headcount. And it has been funny to watch. Uh, I don't know if you saw the way you're paid attention to the way some of these, these stock, the stock price react to these layoffs, but stock price has bounced when, or yeah. has, has gone up, you know, uh, yeah. when, when these layoffs have been announced. So I think everyone kind of thinks the headcount has gotten a little. A little high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Places. And obviously, yeah, it's cost cutting, so it it, it improves the, the bottom line when they uh the <laughs> when they do that. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, it's I, I guess it's 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 really tough to know the future. Whenever we play the the macro sort of crystal ball, um, the macro crystal ball game, then then it's pretty tough, I guess. But it it, it seems like you're relatively. You know, I, I'd say like cautiously optimistic, at least on 2023. Is that an accurate sort of summation about yeah. how you're thinking about things? Yeah, that's that's pretty good. So I would, I think in general, 2023 will be a positive year. So you know, in terms of Bitcoin price, will probably end up higher at the end of the year. Um, but if I kind of analyze that to you know 2019 or 14, 15, there's going to be a lot of volatility. Probably there could be uncertainties as play out. Um, but broadly, I think it will be an up year. And that's based on all things I talked about um, in terms of, I think, macro cycles shifting in the right direction. We haven't talked about it, but gold is breaking out um, and usually mm. leads kind of at the bottom of these cycles for Bitcoin as well. Sentiment was disastrous. Also, um, you know, normally occurs at a bottom. On-chain value um, at, a, at an optimal period, we've had the 80% drawdown, which is pretty much where all the Bitcoin cycles bottom. And then we also have just cycle timing. This Q4 last year and Q1 this year is pretty much a smack bang in the middle of where every Bitcoin cycle bottoms uh, on the four-year cycle. So yeah. the bottom's probably in, in my mind, but the year out of that can be slow and volatile, but to the generally, with the, you know, if you put a trend line through it, to the upside. So I think it will be a positive year. And then probably the real value will be in 2024. And what I mean by that is, especially with Bitcoin cycles, you usually have this obviously four years and about 12, 18 months is where you see the, the really big gains. Um, and then you have those kind of three or two and a half, three years of sideways down, which have probably been in since early 2021, really. So we're now at uh, <laughs> two years of that. So I think we're coming out of that, the back end of that, and then the real upside opportunities probably play out when you get that momentum, everything kind of align uh, probably with a pivot of the Fed whenever that happens in the next six, you know, three, six, nine months, whatever it may be. But that should all kind of line up together pending no other macro major changes mm-hmm. or uncertainty that we haven't foreseen. And assuming the data continues as is, then I, I would suggest that yeah, late 23 and then First half 24 will probably be the, the real upside, but this year I'm expecting kind of to be positive. Yeah. I've got, um, you know, one, one sort of question slash observation for you. And then uh, I, I want to close on uh, another question just about whether or not you see a, a possible decorrelation between equities and, and Bitcoin specifically. But, you know, for a long time, right, the narrative and the, sort of the one liner for Bitcoin is to, it's a hedge against inflation. And Bitcoin has that narrative has taken a little bit of a beating, right? Because the mm. popular idea is, oh, well, you know, inflation came up and look at how Bitcoin performed. But uh, I'm actually starting to think that that's an unfair criticism of Bitcoin because for two reasons. So one, gold, right? The original hedge against inflation 
it performs, it's got an inverse correlation to real rates. So gold in the past, and like if you look at, you mentioned it, it was very volatile in the 1970s. It doesn't mm. peak exactly when inflation is peaking. It peaks before yeah. inflation is peaking because it's sniffing out uh, negative real rates, right? So, and, and then ex when inflation is peaking, it actually tends to, to perform poorly because it's peaking out, it's sniffing out that real rates are about to rise because the Fed is going to raise interest rates. Yeah. If you also think about what it, a inflation hedge is, it's insurance, right? So mm. insurance is priced properly. If you're buying home insurance, you're buying, it's priced properly before your house is on fire. You can't yeah. buy ho house insurance when the house is already on fire, right? On if fire, you had exactly. bought Bitcoin <laughs> or gold before any of this inflation kicked off, you'd be doing extremely well. So I'm just curious, you know, to get your perspective on whether or not you think, you know, whether or not you think that inflation still holds up as, or sorry, if Bitcoin still holds up as an inflation hedge. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't have said that better. <laughs> that was a great summary in, in comparison with gold. Um, so, yeah, I, I must admit I was a bit shocked how poorly um, Bitcoin did, especially later um, 21 or, or mid late 21. Obviously, we had a lot of other things playing out then China, et cetera, under this in, inflation environment. But when you look at it, as you say, in the long scale, look at gold and, and, how, and how that has compared um, with inflation, it's actually not surprising. As you said, the value is maximized before the event. Um, and if you look at the decade of the 70s, gold was really volatile, ended up about 10x up, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, significant 20, 50% drops, uh, which aligned with those changes in rates. So, and, and inflation is usually quite tricky to get a handle of. So while I do think at the top is in, and I've said that quite a bit with inflation in the near term, I wouldn't be surprised if in six, 12, 24 months, maybe it, it again starts to pick up depending on how the Fed obviously manages it and if they do print into a weakening economy. So through those periods, there'll be volatility with Bitcoin, but at the end of it, when you come out of that inflation period, you know, the confidence in fiat money is usually diminished. The, the, the val relative value of the harder money like gold and Bitcoin is usually much higher. So I think that this decade or, you know, call it eight or nine years from here is very similar to the seventies um, where gold and Bitcoin and, and now Bitcoin will probably do incredibly well and stocks basically go sideways. So they didn't do much in that period because of that uncertainty um, and because of the inflation. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think the narrative is, is over. It's obviously had a bit of a beating um, with broader population. Mm. But like I said, if you zoom out of the moment and look at the, the multi-year period, it's probably doing exactly what you'd expect. Mm. And that, that kind of gets at my, my last question for you, which is, do you think it's possible? Is it possible? We've, we've seen a very high correlation. I think the, the, one, the one narrative that I'm almost ready to put to bed is Bitcoin is a decorrelated uh, asset. I, I think it's, mm. you know, bit, crypto and, and Bitcoin have, has performed in a, in a relatively correlated way. I, I will say that I don't think that's a negative thing. Like, I think it's a, it's a plus for this asset class that it slots into a framework for global asset allocators, right? At the end of the day, we we want that, right? We want people to be thinking about this asset class and framework so they know when to invest and um, and, and how that, that all fits in. So I, I don't think that's a, a, a bearish thing at all, but I also do think it's it's correlated. So I'm I'm sort of looking out and I'm I'm careful because I want this to be true. So tell, tell me if yeah. I'm wrong, but I, I actually look out and I feel very rosy about Bitcoin and crypto, but I don't feel as rosy about stocks. And equities, yeah. Um, and and I, I'm curious if you agree with that sentiment. And then, do you think it's possible for Bitcoin to for crypto to kind of break this correlation that we've had to big tech and the Nasdaq? And is it possible for crypto to outperform in an environment where you don't have tech or the S and P performing? Yeah, yeah. Good question. I, I I do. So if you again look at ten years of Bitcoin history, its correlation with equities has pretty much been on average zero. And it's mm. been an oscillator, like a wave around zero. Um, the unusual period was 2021, where it just shot right up to almost one-to-one -one correlation. And it has come down a little bit, but it's spent a lot longer than normal in that high period. And I do think that is, an, is you know, in general, correlations will probably be a bit higher as, as this asset class grows you know, into trillions of dollars. Of course, it's going to tie in more with these 
macro markets more and more. So we should expect a high level of correlation at different times to equities, gold, et cetera. Um, whereas rewind four or five years, no one in those markets was playing in this field. So it, it makes sense right. that the correlations are close to zero. So yeah, in general, there will be somewhat higher correlations in my mind, but I don't think it's going to stick at these high levels. Um, I, I, I agree with you that I think given the inflation environment where the Fed's at, later ends of debt cycle, et cetera, that the next, you know, seven, eight years is probably going to be somewhat average for stocks. Um, it, it, you know, if, you, if you're if you investing in general, you, you want to probably be pretty bullish on the stock market because it obviously on the most part goes up the last few hundred years. So um, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying get out of stocks and, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that, but on a relative basis, probably in my mind, the opportunity is a little bit less than, say the last 10 years. Um, and if that's right, and it is similar to the seventies with somewhat higher baseline inflation, um, you know, I, even, even if inflation does come down, I wouldn't be surprised if the fed tried to keep it at three, 4% because they need to reduce that debt anyway. So if that sticks, gold's going to do incredibly well, probably Bitcoin's going to do much better. We saw gold go up 10 X in, in the seventies. I wouldn't be surprised if I see Bitcoin do much better than that in the next decade. So it's a it's always a relative trade, um, and all these things can change with the data. But that that's where my mind's at. I think this is quite similar to the seventies, but even worse in terms of the level of debt is way higher. So the Fed just cannot be as tight as they were in terms of rate how high rates. Like the rates got up to seventeen or odd percent in the seventies. It's just not possible today with the level of debt, um, which is multiples higher. So they have to be somewhat easier they have to accept a higher baseline inflation to eat away at that debt so it's you know sustainable um and all of that says okay what's going to do well in that higher baseline inflation environment long term um it's gold and it's bitcoin and that's yeah the the great opportunity mm -hmm. being definitely skewed towards bitcoin being the harder asset next year with the halving and also being significantly smaller and having much larger upside yeah there's, uh, you know, I, I tend to agree with you on that. We just had a, I just did a podcast with or our, our roundup for last week was with, um, with Mark and James Davalos from Horizon Kinetics. And we were sort of talking about structural, uh, James was more on the side of, you know, structural inflation for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, they were both kind of bearish on or thinking that cyclically inflation was going to turn, but there's a bit of a disagreement on structural inflation. And, you know, I, at the risk of being super reductive and making things too simple, you know, our current debt is $31 trillion. We've mm -hmm. the CBO Congressional Budget Office projects $1.6 trillion deficits for 10 years into the future. And the CBO projection is always rosy compared to what ends up being the case. Like there, there's no there's no talk of austerity. You know, politicians on both yeah. sides, first of all, if you look in throughout history, how this typically happens, there's a financial oppression playbook, a reallocation of wealth playbook. And politicians like to give free shit away because that's what helps them get reelected. And exactly. you've, er you've already seen the signs of this. It's, you know, it's, it's price caps on energy over in Europe and suggested in the United States. There's giving back the gas tax to consumers. It's, it's all this stuff that, that doesn't work. And it points to a, an end game of deflation and, or sorry, of inflation and wealth reallocation and, and all that stuff. But uh, I, I would be, I'm in your camp as well there. Um, for sure. Nice. Yeah. And they, they, you know, try it's, it's the incentive structure, as you say, for politics in general, and they're trying to play the hardball of, of high rates. And obviously that is playing out with the fed, but at the same time, you have all these government packages coming through or being proposed, <laughs> which is essentially achieving the exact opposite in one way, form or shape or another about easing for the, and helping people ease, which is not going to help inflation either. So <laughs> Yeah, it, everything in my mind is tilted towards high baseline inflation and and hard assets being the best performers in the next decade. Yeah, I think you said that exactly right. I mean, the Fed is the one that's in the spotlight, and there are all the money printer go burr sort of memes being directed at Jerome Powell. But ultimately, it's Treasury that decides when to spend, and it's the Fed's way to figure out how to how that we how they can achieve that level of spending. So, I agree with you on that. Um, Charles, this has been a really fun conversation, my friend. If people want to find out more about what you do uh, or just follow your work or at, at Capriol Investments, like what's the best way to do that? Yeah, thanks, Michael. It was, it was a pleasure for me as well. Happy to do it. 
Um, so yeah, I'm on Twitter, obviously at Caprioli IO. Um, and then obviously we have our company website, Caprioli.com and we have a, a monthly newsletter where we talk about this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, the markets once a month. Excellent. Well, Charles, thank you very much guys. I highly recommend you uh, check out Charles work. Uh, Charles, we'll have to do it again soon. Sounds great. Catch you soon, Michael. Yeah. Cheers. Bye.